I think uh, we just uh, normally we wait for um, uh, for a few minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Yeah. So three more minutes. Um, and also, I'll just uh, remind everybody uh, that uh, the course, I just opened up all the days. Uh, some of you have, have already seen this. Here it is again. Uh, so if you go on this page, uh, and we'll, we'll look at it today, you should see you know, all the different, um, uh, all the different uh, uh, pieces there. So no, no surprise. Um, and uh, we will be recording this meeting. We're recording it now. Uh, and this will be available uh, shortly, maybe by tomorrow. But but the other two recordings um, uh, that are there on the main landing page, if you haven't seen them already, are, are worth it. Every single one of these meetings are a little bit different. Um, I'm I'm uh, trying to to keep them different enough so that we can put them all together into a kind of self serve uh, you know YouTube playlist that you can just watch whenever you want. Uh, and so uh, we're not going to cover all ex the same details. Some of them will be similar, uh, but some of them will, will not. So today we're going to spend a little bit more time doing some hands-on work. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear my daughter giggling in the background. <clears throat> all right. So any, um, uh, anything we want to discuss as a group uh, before we get started? Uh, by the end of the week, uh, some of us will be uh, good friends. Uh, some of us will do something we're very proud of uh, and excited about. Um, some of us will feel completely overwhelmed, like we're drowning. Uh, is there anything we want to talk about right now as a group? Any questions, any, any concerns? Uh, just as a reminder, uh, this is uh, going to take um, your time. Uh, this is not a passive course. You can't just like watch a video for 30 minutes every day and be done. This is going to take your time and attention. Uh, if you have been building software on Ethereum for a year or two, probably one hour a day is enough, actually. Um, if uh, you are, have, are new to blockchain uh, and have five years or more experience, my guess is maybe a couple hours a day. Uh, max three or four hours a day will be enough. Um, if you're a junior dev with less than a couple of years experience, then less than you know, six hours, I think it's gonna be risky for you. If you spend less than four to six hours a day, it's gonna be a problem because you're not gonna be able to make sense of the moving parts. Um, and if you're not a software developer and you wanna try and learn uh, to build software this week, I'm more than happy to help you, but you better be serious uh, and, and think you know, something like 10 to 15 hours a day like not sort of pretending, but like you wake up in the morning, you have your coffee and you work until you can't see straight and then you can go to sleep and I'm happy to help you this week, um, no problem. But it's, it's gonna be intense. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of new technology. All right, so 6.05, should we get started? Sure, let's go. Okay, I get off my soapbox. I'm gonna be on my soapbox a little bit, prepare yourself. Uh, can you allow me to share screen? Um, here, please. Great, thanks, Sasha. All right. So you should be able to see this screen now. Can uh, you just confirm that this is the case? Yep, we are able yeah. to see you, Sheriff. Okay, great. Hey, is that Nyan? Yeah, it's me. Nice, all right, welcome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so just a reminder to everybody who just joined a couple of minutes ago, um, it's better to have your cameras on. Uh, it helps me to get a sense of, of what you're thinking and, and where you are. Um, if you uh, want to leave your camera off for some reason, that's fine. I'm not going to try and, and, and force you to it or anything like that. Uh, but it does, it does help me. It helps me to relate to you uh, and other people will see you also uh, and, uh, and get an idea of, uh, of what you're thinking. All right. So, um, so let's dive in. Uh, my name's Sharif. Um, Sasha and I are going to be helping you uh, with this course this week. It's a, a very much a, a self-directed, self-paced course. Uh, so as much as you put in, you will get out from the course. Um, let's, uh, let's dig into this. I want to find out who's actually here. So uh, if you would, please, this might take you a minute, you can take a picture of the QR code with your phone, or you can visit slido.com and type in near NCD31, this, you know, on the bottom, and this will allow you to answer these questions. And I want to get an idea of, of who's here, who's in the room, and uh, who's, um, 
uh, who is, um, uh, what kind of level of experience we have? Yeah. Okay. So I can see the counter at the top, about seven people have responded out of, uh, how many people are here, 22? So we'll wait until about 18, 20 people have responded. If you need some help, just speak up. Um, you should be able to go to slido.com and right at the top type near-ncd3-1 and answer the survey. Okay, so please go ahead and, and respond to the survey. 12 people responding now. If you're stuck or you're not quite sure how to answer, please say something in the chat. Um, nice, yeah, thanks for that, Sasha, putting in the, the live poll into the, uh, the window, into the chat window. Okay, so for the sake of time, let's keep going. Uh, about 15 people have responded, uh, and you know you can answer uh, you know multiple things. So um, it's, it seems here like um, about half the class is either less than a year or more than five years, and so this is quite typical. Uh, you know, for for groups uh, who get together to learn, is is you get this kind of you know a double hump of experience where you, people have lots of experience or not so much experience, and so we have to kind of be careful with this range and and how we're going to manage this throughout the week. Okay, let's go to the next survey. Uh, here, uh, try and, and uh, write uh, the standard name for something. So if you spell JavaScript, like with all lowercase, it will be different from the capital J, capital S. So uh, try and, and write the, the kind of uh, standard uh, name for these texts. And I, I want to see what tech is in your comfort zone here. So it should be the same survey. It should have just changed for you on your phone. You shouldn't have to do anything new. Yeah, so, so you can see, yeah. Nice, great. So if you find the spelling for something that you're gonna put in there, please just use the spelling that's already there so the, the word cloud uh, can aggregate uh, properly. Okay, 12 responses so far coming in much faster this time, that's great. Okay, awesome. So about 16 responses in. I'll assume other people just either aren't responding or, oh, awesome, 19. Okay, fantastic. So that that uh, that looks great. I'll just move on to the next one then. But clearly, um, uh, you know, tons of experience and exposure to JavaScript, Node, uh, React, TypeScript, very little bit uh, experience with Rust, uh, Go, Java, C Sharp. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, that, that kind of suggests to us how we're going to spend our focus uh, this week when we're working together. Okay, let, let's go on to the next slide. I want to get a sense of who's all here. What contract language will be your focus? And at this point, I want to strongly suggest to avoid the temptation to try and learn Rust this week. If you don't already know Rust, or if you haven't been writing, say, um, you know, C or C++, um, it's going to be difficult for you to learn about Near and Rust at the same time. So stick with assembly script. If you're comfortable with Rust, or maybe you've written a strongly typed language before, Go, uh, Java, um, C or C++, it, it may be okay for you to aim for Rust or maybe try both of them. Uh, but if you're new to strongly typed languages, if you're coming from a JavaScript background, just focus your attention on assembly script. There's enough going on this week uh, without having to add that, that overhead. Okay, so it looks like um, uh, some people haven't decided that's perfectly fine. Uh, no stress there. Um, looks like all the responses are in. Out of uh, you know 23 people, uh, Sasha and I aren't aren't answering this. So okay, uh, that that's my recommendation. Uh, nobody here for the show only. Okay, nice. I'm I'm here for the show. Let's see how it goes. Okay, good. 
All right, so um, now I just wanna invite you uh, to ask any questions at all that you have. There's like another tab, I think, in the, in the Slido tool. Any questions that you have at all, um, let's hear them now. Uh, I'm not gonna stop and answer them all right now, but I, I will uh, either direct you to the FAQ or I will uh, add to the FAQ, um, or if the, the questions don't have a kind of evergreen value, then I'll, I'll just answer them uh, you know, immediately um, as we're going along. So um, you know, go ahead and, and please add whatever questions you have uh, to this list. Uh, I'd love to see those questions. It doesn't have to be a smart question or uh, it doesn't have to impress anybody, uh, literally anything. You could be asking like, what is a blockchain uh, you might ask, or uh, how do you spell near? Um, I, you know, wh whatever it is um, to, to just kind of get your thoughts out and then vote on questions from other people. All right. And in this way, we will begin to, uh, to learn uh, together uh, as a group. Uh, short answer to when will EVM uh, uh, be on near uh, is later this year, is my understanding. There's a working group that focuses just on that. They publish their work uh, publicly, forum.near.gov or um, uh, 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 sorry, uh, forum.near.org or gov.near.org uh, is a, um, uh, a, a discourse server uh, with uh, public discussions. And there you'll find, uh, you know, news, um, live recordings. Um, they publish on YouTube their, their weekly meetings. So for EVM on near, uh, that, that's there. That, if anybody's not sure what that even means, uh, EVM is the Ethereum virtual machine. We'll cover this briefly today to, to give you a sense of where this fits, but it's basically the computer that is running on the Ethereum network. Uh, that, that's, that's what that is. Okay, it looks like there's a bunch of questions coming in. This is fantastic. Um, what are the technical uh, specific learning outcomes we hope to achieve? Um, yeah, so uh, if you look at the, at the NCD uh, document, which, which we'll see together today, at a very high level, I'm expecting by the end of this week that you're gonna learn how to read, write, test, and deploy contracts on the near platform. Very simple. So any any of these platforms, uh, uh, sorry, any of these technologies, whether it's Rust or Assembly Script, uh, you're going to be able to read a contract, pick a pick a contract and read it. Sorry about the background noise, and um, uh, be able to to write your own contract. Um, And, and so, uh, so uh, you'll be able to read those contracts, make sense of them, reason about how they work. Uh, you'll be able to write new contracts um, of your own creation. You'll be able to write tests, unit and simulation tests for those contracts. And then you'll be able to deploy them uh, to, to test net and, and use them in that way. So that, that's the, the, at a very high level, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, if you wanna dig a little bit deeper, we can do that. Okay, so maybe enough uh, answering those, those first couple of questions. The rest of these I'll take, um, uh, uh, you know, offline. Somebody here is saying, I have zero experience building software. Would it be okay for me to join the program or do I need to learn uh, building something first? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the bottom line is if, if you've never built software, I wouldn't recommend that you start by learning how to build software for the blockchain. Um, I think it's a, a little bit, you know, uh, too much of a stretch. Uh, you can take free code camp uh, online. It's a, a fantastic introduction to basic software development. Uh, there's many other courses. If you're curious about it, just let me know. I'm happy to help uh, get you there. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't take this as, as a first. So if you're here and you're committed to the time, welcome. That's awesome. Pretend like you're just watching a movie uh, with subtitles. Uh, that's how you should spend the week. And, and just enjoy the show. Uh, meet people. Uh, contribute what you can, but don't stress uh, because it's going to be very difficult for you un unless you're willing to put in 10 to 15 hours a day for you to make any sort of meaningful contribution between now and Friday. Uh, if you do want to put in that amount of time, keep asking questions. I'm happy to help you. I've taught people how to build software in a few days. Uh, it's, it's not impossible to do, but you need to be ready to, to really commit yourself. This isn't a part-time thing. Okay. Um, all right. So um, let's, uh, let's keep going. Um, uh, please vote on these questions as well. Th these will remain in this um, place for you uh, for the next 24 hours. If you want to read these questions, vote on them. Uh, the higher ones are going to get more attention first. And I use this slide as kind of a, a mental break in between topics. All right, let's keep going. So um, just a word on focus, if you don't mind here, um, because uh, to, to really make sense of what's happening, I think we, we all need to agree on what we're looking for. So what's a car? Um, you know, if you've studied engineering, maybe you've heard of a Carnot cycle or a Stirling cycle. Uh, if you're a mechanic, you may know what a valve train is or displacement. Uh, certainly, uh, you, you may have, uh, you know, uh, heard people 
talking about master cylinder or whatever, you may recognize these equations from your engineering uh, classes as uh, you know uh, the kind of efficiency of of uh, uh, of the of the system against maybe uh, airflow or something like that. You may know this weird fact that a third of automobile gas uh, is actually consumed by friction. You may recognize some of these diagrams. Uh, you know, again, if you've, if you've worked on uh, cars, you, you may recognize some of the words. You know, adiabatic compression and expansion. Um, but um, but actually, uh, what is a car to us? This here, it's uh, you know the steering wheel, the view from the windshield. It's it's a it's a it's a delightful thing. It's a it's a maybe a place that we use to commute or a relaxing place that we use to clear our, our mind. Right, and in fact, we use cars without understanding all the details about cars. So let's talk about blockchain for a minute. What's blockchain? Validator partitioning and beacon chains and erasure coding and, and you know Byzantine fault tolerant finality and high availability and you know one second block time and and all of this kind of stuff. And on near, in fact, you might know this weird fact that uh, developers can earn 30% of transaction fees to the contract. Uh, although we boast that transaction fees are you know hundreds or uh, thousands of times cheaper than Ethereum, uh, the contract earns 30% of those. So he, here's some, some interesting facts, but actually what is near to us, right, is a smart contract platform, right? Maybe there's some, some standard languages there like assembly script and Rust, right? And in fact, we can use near without understanding how everything works. So I'm not saying don't dig deep. I'm saying don't put understanding everything as a prerequisite. You can get into a car and start driving and learn more later as, you know, after you park, pick up a book and start reading about the car, that's fine. I don't wanna get in your way. In fact, I'm trying to get out of your way, but be careful about the temptation to insist that you understand everything about consensus, for example, or that you understand everything about how the, the you know, find that we arrive at finality, for example, before you start building for the platform. Don't don't do that to yourself, okay? Uh, so for the rest of this week, um, just focus on making something simple by the end of the week, and I'll show you exactly how simple. Skip consensus and economics. Read about it on Saturday in the weekend. Get really excited this week about how it works, and then spend your Saturday and Sunday reading about consensus and economics. For now, focus on working examples. Don't try and learn Rust this week if you've never written with Rust. Don't do it. Uh, it's going to slow you down to the point of being unproductive. Uh, instead, focus on the best language for you. If you're ready to learn Rust, go for it. It's awesome. There's a lot of examples we have in Rust. If not, if you're coming from a JavaScript background, please focus on assembly script. It's going to be much easier for you. And also, uh, forget about front end code this week. Uh, focus instead on the stuff that's new. So be careful about this temptation to retreat to competence when we're a little bit confused, when we're struggling with something, when we want to remind ourselves that we know what's going on, we leave the thing that's hard and we focus on the thing that's familiar to us. You know, writing a React component to log into Nier or something like that because it's like kind of in our comfort zone. This retreat to competence is very tempting. Don't do that this week. Struggle and suffer with me, with us. Risk failure in public so that we may learn together. Okay, don't sort of pull off and, and do something that's comfortable for you. St stay in the struggle with us, okay? All right, so enough on that. So where are we? If, if you haven't, um, yeah, thanks, Daniello. Uh, uh, in, in the chat there, Daniello is suggesting a, a, tip, a tip for us, yeah. Um, okay, so, so I'm gonna try and, and frame what's happening for you. And I hope by the end of this, your mind is buzzing with possibility. Uh, if not, I need to improve this part of the presentation. So we're at the cusp of a new era. You may have seen this if you watch the other recordings, by the way. Um, so um, the, the, if you imagine sort of the, the web as having evolved over the last, I don't know what, 70 years uh, and, and sort of these, these arcs that move from the mid 1900s into this decade. Here's what we're looking at. Uh, 1940s uh, and 50s, machines were the size of a house, then a bus, then a desk. Now you have a computer on your wrist or in your phone uh, that uh, you know, maybe you got for free with a phone contract that's always connected to the internet, high speed you know, bandwidth. 
Okay, so these connected machines. Um, you can uh, read them. We used to be able to read, you know, from say ARPANET or some local, you know, internal university network or something like that. Uh, bulletin board systems in the 80s. Uh, you know, the the uh, kind of uh, you know, net, net, Netscaped web in in the uh, 90s and AOL. Uh, today, you ask Siri for the weather, and Siri, a robot, will read the internet for you and tell you what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. Uh, so that's the readable web. The writable web, again, with you know ARPANET, bulletin board systems in the 80s, uh, maybe uh, you know basic websites with blinking, you know GeoCities under construction. If you remember that, uh, all the way today, you can uh, shoot a live, uh, you know Twitch stream or YouTube stream from your mobile phone uh, and know uh, that uh, that uh, will get out to your audience uh, in you know with a few hundred milliseconds of latent latency worldwide. Right. That that's kind of the the reality of the writable web today. The trusted web, we could say, started in uh, 1976 with Diffie-Hellman's paper on public key cryptography, crediting Ralph Merkel with this sort of scheme for how do you exchange secrets in public. Um, within a few years, uh, you know, Chom was writing uh, papers about uh, uh, you know identity and and security and and secrecy. Uh, invented something I think called uh, e-money uh, about 10 years later in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, the cypherpunk movement swelling up, uh, you know, around some of these ideals in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, uh, Nick Zabo coining smart contracts, inventing hash cash somewhere in the mid 90s. Um, uh, way down inventing B money, uh, conversations in the cypherpunk mailing list around that. And then 2008, nine, whenever Satoshi uh, Nakamoto published the Bitcoin uh, white paper that brought a bunch of these ideas together uh, in, in uh, you know, one or two novel ways. Um, today, uh, this has created for us uh, this, this kind of uh, soil, this topsoil of truth in which it is more expensive to lie than it is to tell the truth. And into this soil, we can plant things we care about, like identity, money, ownership, Providence, and this topsoil is sitting on top of this bedrock of the other, you know, always connected high broadband machines that we know, you know, with TCP/IP, will guarantee the delivery of data from some remote server, uh, and uh, and and with our, our fast uplink, we'll take our data back out to those systems. Uh, and so, uh, in in this way, we we have this this sort of new layer um, uh, of truth on top of of this this infrastructure. And so into this layer, we can start having conversations about decentralized autonomous organizations. You may have heard of DAOs, basically uh, you know, organizations of human beings that are run by software, governed by software. Um, uh, we can talk about token economics and mechanism design. Um, you, you know, there's a, an example of, uh, for example, um, uh, kickback dot events. If you haven't heard of it, uh, you can um, sign up for an event, uh, pay your deposit for the event. If you show up, they take your money, no problem. But if you don't show up, actually, you forfeit your deposit and the people that arrived at the event get a portion of what you paid. So showing up pays you, in fact. You might attend the event for free. Um, that requires no lawyers, no banks, no contracts, nothing except a smart contract that collects fees for the event, and then something like a proof of presence or whatever, a QR code or, or some, some scheme to be able to check that you physically arrived at the event and pay you out from the proceeds of people who didn't show up to the event. That's called kickback events. You can look it up now. And there's several of these kinds of things. In fact, the graph and indexing service has a, a pretty interesting um, uh, system set up with, with mechanism design for people who are uh, indexing uh, you know, blockchain uh, systems, curating which systems they should be indexing, delegating capital to uh, the indexers so that they can maintain high quality indices of these, of these sources of data. Uh, so you can read about the graph and, and their mechanism design. They have a couple of nice articles on Medium where they explain some of these details. But in the end, no banks, no lawyers, no contracts, uh, legal contracts, no, no government policing any of this stuff. It's simply code uh, that manages these relationships. That's kind of the, the aha moment. All right, and then this idea, you know, sort of wa waving our hands now, total disintermediation. Uh, you know, we can have all sorts of uh, wonderful uh, APIs. There's a nice token economics course that's linked in these slides. I'll, I'm happy to share that with you. By the way, as we're moving through, if you have any other questions, any other comments, anything else you want to bring to our collective attention, just put it into the list of questions, OK? So you, the same list of questions, just add your question there or go and vote there. Something else occurs to you. Hey, what is, what is mechanism design? You know, what, what is that exactly? What, you mentioned something about kickback something. What is that exactly?
Any of that kind of stuff you want me to review, please add your question. Okay, so super fast, hello near. I'm not gonna read these slides to you. Um, our story is that we are um, a, a compelling offering in this space, this smart contract development space, right? And, and here's why. It's easy to learn, it's easy to use, um, and we have some, some features like our account system, our account model, which makes it easier to reason about complex relationships among contracts. And in production, it's cheaper, um, it pays out, uh, there's some optimizations and it's, it's faster. When you build an application on Near, you're using the same infrastructure that we use. So your, your decentralized application, your DAP, connects through Near API JS, a wrapper for the RPC interface, remote procedure call, think you know, methods over the wire, you send JSON you know, uh, over HTTP and uh, communicate with the service that way. Um, and then the Near protocol network takes care of your requests, whatever your requests are. We use the same uh, technology for near.dev examples, for near explorer, near wallet, near CLI, we're all using the same stuff. And so that basically suggests to you that we uh, will, we are just as motivated to, to maintain high quality um, uh, code and interfaces and stable APIs here. When you talk about a, a specific uh, transaction that you send, your app might use near API JS in step one to send in step two, a call to the RPC interface, the blockchain layer, then apply, uh, that's a specific name of a function actually, apply that request into the runtime layer, a virtual machine spins up, step four loads your smart contract code, step five, while running that contract code maybe reads and writes to state storage, your, your, the data on chain. And then step six returns the result within 200 uh, milliseconds uh, max uh, lifetime for that virtual machine, uh, 200 teragas, that's, that's the upper limit for how long that code can run. And then back to your application. Your contracts being written in, in assembly script near SDK AS or in Rust near SDK RS and deployed into the, the network. And again, if you want to see this uh, broken down, the, the two previous recordings, uh, or at least one of them, walk through this step by step. Right? So you can watch the other two recordings, uh, I think 90 and 60 minutes respectively, and, and then that way you can cover this in more detail if you want. Let's touch briefly on collections. When you're reading and writing to state storage, we have this kind of key value pair state storage. right? And so the, the, uh, there is a special keyword called state uh, for some contracts. Uh, if it's a Rust contract, it'll definitely be there uh, for assembly script if you use a particular uh, design, a singleton approach to designing the contract, then you'll have this keyword state and the contract code will be in there. But otherwise it's any arbitrary key value pair, key value pair, key value pair. So a message, a counter or whatever. At the bottom here, we have these um, collections and these collections are, are abstractions around the key value storage. So that make it make the key value storage feel like a vector or a persistent set or, you know, or whatever, right? And so here are some of these uh, collections in assembly script and Rust. And you can see we, we kind of, we've, we've marked them as, you know, is it iterable? Can you clear all the values and so on to give you an idea. And if you go to docs.near.org, look for concepts in the top navigation and then data storage on the left-hand side, you'll find this and much more documentation about how these collections work. And so when you're writing your contract, you're using these collections to communicate with the storage, with the database, you can think of it. Right? That's how you communicate with it. Otherwise, it's just a key value store. You're you, at a key, you set a value. At a key, you read a value. If you want something a little bit more sophisticated, you use these collections that basically wraps the key value store. And again, if you have any questions about this, just add it to the list. Okay, so uh, let's agree on a path. What's in this week and what's not? So uh, we're going to be talking about testnet, local net, and beta net. Um, and uh, EVM is there, by the way, for the person who asked about that. You can use it on beta net now. We're not talking about main net, where it's real money, real identity. Uh, that's uh, going to be more work to figure out, you know, how do you operate in a defensive environment where real capital is at stake? Um, you know, how do you manage uh, trustless contracts where you've removed all the full access keys and you want to version the contract, for example? Some of these questions come up on mainnet uh, where uh, it's, it's out of scope for this week. So this week we're really talking about reading, writing, testing, and deploying.
to test that, okay? Um, contract literacy, not contract security. If, if you wanna dig deep, you're more than welcome to. We've got some great examples to look at, but we won't be covering this explicitly. Um, NFTs and fungible tokens, we can talk about those, but we won't talk about token economics and mechanism design. We will be looking at the near core contracts, but don't ask me how to port Uniswap to near. If you gave me a week, I don't know if I would even be able to give you an estimate of the level of complexity of doing that. So it's, it's, we're keeping it simple this week. And cross-contract calls, how do you communicate among contracts? That's where the near scalability story comes in, where we can get parallelization among contracts. Uh, we are not gonna be talking about sharded compute and storage at a theoretical level. You can read the paper about that. I personally have a hard time following some of those papers myself, but if you get it, more power to you. And I would say, read it and explain it to us. Like you're more than welcome to, I would love that. So logistically, we've got meetings, synchronous and asynchronous activities on the left-hand side, Monday through Friday. So here it's, you know, um, uh, this time today, we have uh, a 60 minute uh, scheduled, but we can extend if we need to. Um, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday for 30 minutes, we'll meet some QA logistics, key questions, whatever. Usually these meetings are lasting 30 to 60 minutes, uh, but we can continue. We have two hours reserved for you. Everything else is asynchronous, right? So uh, th this is the synchronous activities, this welcome and the kickoff that we're doing right now. Tomorrow, uh, Wednesday and Thursday process and aha moments that we share. And then Friday we have demos uh, and saying goodbye. And uh, asynchronous is the reading, writing, testing, and deploying contracts. It's, it's really on you to make this week work. Okay, a lot of self-directed work. And you're gonna be working in groups, by the way. So you can do some solo work for sure, but you'll be producing demos as a group. So what is a demo? By the end of the week, each team is gonna deliver something that looks like this. And we've got a couple of examples for you actually, seven total examples. So uh, the, the scope is defined by this project, Nearly Neighbors. And don't worry about all the details here, reading all these details. You can check out the, the repository, github.com slash learn dash near and then Nearly Neighbors. And basically what you'll see is this is a project like Kickstarter for your neighborhood on blockchain where you can propose, hey, I want a coffee shop down the street and I want to attach, you know, a uh, hundred near tokens to that coffee shop. And uh, that way you become uh, one of the proposers for this project. If we hit the threshold, then the proposal turns into a project, uh, which actually realizes the coffee shop when maybe an investor and a builder come in and actually decide to make it, let's say an entrepreneur. And then you get you know, some benefits as part of that, you know, uh, uh, free coffee for a year or whatever it is based on your, your early investment, right? That, that's kind of the idea here. So we didn't get into all the details, but it's enough to understand how do you write a contract? This one is in assembly script, but there are many examples in Rust as well. Uh, unit tests, simulation, tests, the mock-ups only, these are just balsamic, very low fidelity, you can tell, very low fidelity uh, wireframes, and the documentation that you see splattered all over the page here, including, you know, build commands and testing commands and so on. So there is no front end for this. And again, I'll remind you, building a front end for this is extra. It's not necessary because I, I don't believe you're going to be learning very much if you're a front-end developer and you're building a front-end for your contract, in the end, it's a few lines of code that you're using. And you, of course, there may be some patterns there in terms of how do you manage keys and access and signing in and signing out. But we have several examples about how to do this. You can pick up any one of those examples and learn from it. The real challenge for this week is how do you write a contract? How do you write tests for that contract to avoid regression when you change? How do you simulate the behavior of that contract, especially multiple contracts that are communicating uh, using cross-contract calls? And how do you deploy that contract to testnet? Okay, so focus on the back end is another way to say that. We also have three sample projects and, and four demo projects. So the nearly neighbors is this one on the bottom left here that's highlighted in yellow, but there are others. So two from each, two demos each from the previous two cohorts. This is the third run of near certified developer. You can take a look and see what they look like. Near riddles, redirector extension, near wagers, near dice. These are working examples. And I think the near dice and near riddles are probably the two kind of most complete examples with contracts and front end. But also we have a lottery sample, meme museum as a sample and nearly neighbors as a sample. So this gives you an idea of, of what the scope is of this work. What is, what is your output as a group going to look like? All right. Groups of, you know, two, four, I, I would keep it maximum of four people in the group. 
If you want to do your own individual project, that's fine as well. No problem. And so what does the end of this week look like defining success is that at the end of this course, you can earn this L1 you know, uh, uh, participant certification, which says you've completed the course this week, you were here, you showed up, you delivered a demo. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, the verified developer uh, means you and I sit down or some other experienced near developer for a 30 to 60 minute code review. And, and we verify that you actually understand the code that was produced. You can explain it. Uh, I can delete some of the code and you can come back and, and fix it. Um, I can change a test and you can modify the code to pass the new test, for example. Uh, we can refactor it. We can add a new feature. That's what we'll be doing in the 30 to 60 minute code review for the verified uh, developer level. Okay, so just to give you a, a, a distinction there, if you just show up, participate in the demo, contribute to a team, um, and, and take shared credit for the demo, that's the L1 participant. If you want the verified, it means you, you actually need to have a code review uh, with me or, or some other you know, qualified reviewer where we're going to dig into the code, the implementation itself. Yeah, and Sasha, thank you, has posted a little bit more about the, the program in the chat. Okay, uh, L2 is a, a future certification. We have will be something like testnet application with 100 users and L3, a mainnet application with 1,000 users, something like that to give you an idea of, of where we fit. Okay, so this course here is about basic liter literacy and getting started as a re remote first part-time course, uh, you know, where a, a developer can do this during their lunch hour if they have some experience in blockchain or as a junior dev, you can do it maybe with like a couple of hours of work, you know, two to four hours of work, something like that no more than six hours of work a day, kind of pushing yourself, okay? And so what next or what else could you do? At the end of this, uh, there's a, and during the week also, you're more than welcome, this Figment Learn pathway will pay you, you know, uh, money in tokens, uh, you know, something about 20 US dollars worth of tokens for 30 minutes of your time to try some code. In fact, everybody gets paid for finishing this course as well. Uh, there's a, um, uh, some rates that we pay for participation and then prizes that we pay for, uh, you know, winning uh, demos at the end, something like that. Sasha has the details on these. Maybe he can share them a little bit later or asynchronously. Uh, we have a bounties program where you can earn to solve our ideas. We have some ideas. Um, and so, you know, um, uh, a thousand near tokens or up to 10,000 near tokens, something like that. Per bounty, it takes some time to finish. A grants program where you bring your ideas and we fund, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, tens of thousands or, or uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of tokens to, to build out, uh, you know, new projects, new products, new features on the network. Open Web Collective is like an incubator, raised uh, 15 million dollars for organizations that were teams that were going through that last year in 2020. And there's other things here, you know, Gitcoin Kernel, for example, has an eight week fellowship. If anybody's curious about that, I have, um, uh, you know, kind of access, a discounted access to that uh, program as well. It's basically a eight week boot camp to uh, work with a bunch of entrepreneurs in the Web3 space on, on building a, an idea. Okay. So um, let's talk about beginning this process well. What does that actually look like? So um, if, if you can, if you know in your life, someone who's you know, three years old or two years old, it's, it's right at the edge where uh, children become self-conscious about performance in understanding. So right around three and a half or four, four and a half is where kids start to feel a little bit ashamed of not knowing, of not catching up. But before that, they don't care actually. They'll just, they'll start babbling things. They'll use words they don't know. Uh, without any hesitation, they'll grab something and start playing with it. You know, and, and you've all seen the kind of uh, classic comedy where the, 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 the kid keeps pushing the spoon off the table a thousand times while they build the heuristic to see. One in a thousand times, does gravity lift the spoon up? No, actually, a thousand out of a thousand times, the spoon falls, they say, right? So as you're learning, think of it in terms of experimentation, exploration, shameless, guilt-free play, right? That's kind of what we're looking for. Commit yourself, please, to being shamelessly selfish in what you need. Keep asking and asking and asking until you get what you need. And sustainably generous, I say, so that nobody's up at 2 a.m. trying to respond to questions. You don't owe anybody anything beyond what's sustainably generous. 
do your best to help people. If you know the answer, if you think of something, if you realize someone's confused, you have a little bit of extra time, give it. But don't stress about it. In terms of getting, also don't hesitate, don't stress. Just get, keep asking over and over and over. So these two together give us the kind of the right uh, structure to operate in, in a, a, a high pressure, uh, high intensity learning experience like this one. Okay, keep asking till you get it and give as much as you can, please, for, for each other as well. You understand. Okay, so let's talk a little bit. How's this week gonna go? Uh, we're gonna have meetings like this where you're asking questions, I'm talking a little bit, maybe you're talking to each other, maybe you're, you have ideas, you're helping, that, that's kind of how it's gonna happen. And then we're gonna split up. You're gonna get together with other people in the group and you're gonna do work, reading things, writing things, trying things, following instructions and so on. And I'll show you kind of what those instructions look like briefly. Um, we've already talked about how much time you should commit, so I won't repeat that. Um, you should spend your time uh, pushing yourself. So if there's like three things you should read, but you know, 30 that you could read, go for the 30. Always pushing, pushing, pushing. Um, you ask for help in Discord. Uh, if you fall behind, if you get sick or busy, uh, it's no problem. You, you can always just retake this course again. So every two weeks, we have the same course. Uh, and it, it just keeps improving every time. We keep adding new features or adding more explanations, or we get more demos from the last instance, as you've seen already. So no stress. If, if you can't keep up with this course, if it's too fast for you, just punt and come to the next one. If you end up getting distracted or super busy at work, it happens. Just Unplug and come back, no, no guilt, no shame. But you have to make sure that your team knows what you're doing. So be super clear about that stuff. If suddenly you're not available, you should let your team know. You don't wanna sort of leave people kind of you know, uh, wondering what happened to you, right? Um, and so um, I would recommend for, for progress, to measure your progress, if, you know, depending on your own learning style, it, it's quite helpful actually to prove to yourself that you're learning. So some, some people don't realize as they're learning. It's, it's sort of the process happens kind of invisibly in the back of your mind. But if, if you start, let's say today by reading a contract uh, is one of the first exercises we're gonna do. You read a contract and it's totally disorienting for you. Read the same contract every day. Actually leave that contract open somewhere on your computer and reread it every single day. And what you'll find is within two or three days, it, it's starting to make sense. You're starting to see new things about the contract. That's quite a simple, tactic for, for testing your own knowledge. Um, and then we talked about L1 participant versus L1V verified developer, all right? So in terms of your solo activities, you're gonna be surveying code, reading, cloning repos, running tests, editing code. As you can imagine, group activities, you're gonna be pairing some sync, some async. As groups, you're gonna to wanna to organize yourselves into to have meetings, maybe on Discord, to have calls. So probably you wanna organize around language. So if you have uh, you know, several people who prefer speaking, as has happened before Chinese, for example, or Turkish or Arabic, you wanna to get together with people who are speaking those languages so that you have the highest fidelity communication channel. You're not struggling. You know, sometimes there's a, a Chinese speaking group, a Russian group. We've had each of those in the last two cohorts because there are people who are speaking these languages natively. And then, you know, other people are in English speaking groups, for example. But we also have some participants now from Turkish and you know, speak Turkish or Arabic. And so you, you may want to organize yourself around these uh, language groups because it's going to be much easier to communicate much faster, right? Um, especially some of the subtle stuff when you're when you're confused or disoriented. Um, so uh, the, sa the same uh, start time every day as this meeting so that you're not disoriented. 45 minutes ago, we started. We're going to do the same thing every single day, five days a week. The only meetings that are required are today and Friday. The other meetings are optional. So don't stress if for some reason you can't make it Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. You can certainly come in, but don't stress. You can ask your team what happened or what you missed or whatever. Um, but today and Friday are the two key ones. So, and of course, you're going to want to spend time connecting with your um, uh, with your team. On Thursday, as part of the workload, you can, in fact, you can see it. On Thursday, we ask you to commit what are you going to be demonstrating on Friday so that we know what how to predict what's happening on Friday. So I'm going to show you really quick, like what one of these starter kits looks like. Uh, th this is a, a starter for assembly script Rust. There's similar, there's some boilerplate and so on, but I haven't uh, built the Rust one yet. Forgive me, but you'll see uh, now, uh, you know what this looks like. So um, just to, to kind of quickly uh, take a look, 
Uh, here is the course link, you know, that, that starts with, you know, or ends with slash NCD. You've all seen this, I imagine, right? Please say something now if you haven't seen this before, right? Everybody should have already seen this page. Um, and I can just zoom in a little bit if that makes it easier to read. Is that better? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so here, um, you know, you should definitely read through this. Uh, there's the invitation to Discord right here. So if you haven't joined the Discord server, please do that. Uh, there's a quick uh, intro. Don't worry about this availability because we've already done it. Like that's this meeting, right? Um, and then there's some pre-work. If you haven't done this, it's, it's about 10 hours of pre-work actually. This is, this is a little bit low, uh, but you should do at least the first hour or so where you create an account and, and so on, okay? Uh, so that you can, you can kind of get a sense of what's going on. And, and that pre-work Work looks like um, uh, looks like uh, uh, this. So every one of these things has like a core activities like this, and then there's some you know stuff to do. So here you should create a near account, uh, review some of these documents here for about 10, 20 minutes, read this, get started. So at a minimum, you should do that. If you're still not clear on what's happening with this blockchain stuff, here's 10 hours worth of videos that you can dive through that will make it absolutely clear what's going on and why this is such a big deal. Um, and then there's a few other uh, bits here that are, are uh, you know, interesting podcast episodes. And if you're curious about you know, sort of what, why does somebody say Bitcoin is actually a clock, uh, that's an interesting article right there. Okay. So, and here's a sort of a random article from 1998 where Adam Beck is reacting to, to Way Day's B Money. Uh, this is sort of one of the, the uh, quoted uh, uh, cypherpunk uh, kind of mailing list um, uh, entries that, that everybody sort of talks about as being an early indicator of what's going on. Um, okay, so um, here is reading Web3, writing Web3, testing Web3, deploying, and demonstrating. So, this is all five days. We've opened them all up for you. And you can see here, I mentioned on Thursday, you'll come in and, um, and actually uh, uh, reserve your demo spot by uh, filling out this, uh, this demo presentation, you know, with your email, name of your demo. Uh, what's the current status I wanna know? Like, is it working in progress or just an idea? And then what's it gonna be like at demo time? Like less than 24 hours later, is it gonna be working or in progress? So no, no ideas, you can't just present an idea during the demo time. It's gotta be either working software or in progress, hopefully working software, but no stress if it's just in progress. And we won't shame you or anything like that. Any demo description, any attachments, screenshots, whatever. And then your team name and the members. One person will submit this one, right? If multiple people submit it, no, no big deal. Like we'll be able to, 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 to sort that out, okay? So that, that's day four. Um, and uh, today, day three, uh, sorry, uh, day one, um, we have, uh, you know, this, this list here. So every day is the same. You got these core activities, watch this stuff, you know, check this stuff out, you know, whatever it is. And, and then here I've got this bonus activity uh, to clone the starter and, and go through it. So I'm, I'm about to show you this bonus activity right now. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes walking you through this. And then there's a few other things here that you can do, read all the contracts and so on. The goal of day one is to read. So here you've got this list of assembly script contracts. You're going to go through and read them, right? or Rust contracts, you're gonna go through and read them, and then you're gonna submit this form once per contract. So the instructions are fairly clear, right? This is your, your work to do, all right? Um, and then here we've got recordings from the, the past two uh, meetings. And um, uh, you know, just a reminder here that, that we pay you for this. Here's some basic estimates of the amount of time that you need. If you're using Windows, uh, make sure you make a little bit of extra time for yourself. There's some configuration challenges you might run into, stuff like that. Uh, we're not talking about uh, token price or any of that nonsense here. This is all about writing contracts and, and learning together. Um, I uh, encourage you to cheat uh, heavily this week. Um, whatever it is that you can do to learn from other people's work, learn from examples, reuse those examples, reusing code. Um, I think that that's a great way to learn. But remember, um, to, to get the, certific the certificate of participation, you got to show up for the demo. To, to get the verified uh, certificate, you're going to pass an, a code interview. So even if you're copying code, you're going to need to explain it and rewrite it and handle if I ask you to refactor or delete a test or delete the code itself. So even if you're copying this week, you better be paying close attention to what you're copying. Okay, that's, that's the, the trick. Cheat, but pay attention to how you're cheating. 
<laughs> that's the message maybe. Okay. Um, and if you, if you don't have time for any of this stuff, if you're a developer with several years of experience, you just want to sort of get to it. Here is the fastest single path that I can point you to. Read this one document. It'll explain everything about Near in one page. And then you can watch our core devs explain core contracts in live contract review, a bunch of app development patterns in live app review, the core team talking about the runtime and how it works, also YouTube videos, uh, and then Learn Near has a bunch of other workshops and stuff that you can dig into and, and, and use on, on mainnet, applications you can use on mainnet. There's also like a full-on extended FAQ with a bunch of questions this week. If you have questions like, you know, what, what are we gonna learn? you know, this week, and what do I have to submit at the end of the week, you know, stuff like that. Okay, so this is like a full on FAQ with a bunch of questions. And so some of the questions you asked me today, I'll, I'll probably add to this FAQ as I did last time. All right. So, um, so let's stop there uh, with this. Uh, and then I'm just going to show you can, can you can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. All right, so um, so here is this uh, this uh, repository. This is um, GitHub Learn Excuse me, Learn Near. Oh, the screen is lagging. One minute. Oh, that's terrible. Um, so this is the Learn Near um, uh, uh, GitHub organization. If you search here for the word sample, you'll find the samples. If you search here for the word NCD, for the letters NCD, you'll find the four demos from before. Okay. And starter, you'll find the starter kit that I'm about to show you right now. This Rust uh, starter kit is not, is not yet real. It's a placeholder. Okay. But here's for assembly script. This is what we're about to walk through. Uh, and so, uh, so in this starter kit, uh, what we're looking at is a very simple contract. So here, here it is at a very high level. There's a contract with some methods. I'm not sure how big to make this. All right. So there's a contract with some methods, and there's a README here that kind of walks through the design of this contract. So you can see, like, this is what the methods look like some important distinctions between view and change methods. A view method is one you just kind of read and a change method is something that's gonna either access the, the execution context, so it needs to be signed, or you're gonna change the state of the blockchain, so it needs to be a signed transaction, right? So that, that's kind of the, from a web developer's perspective, a big difference here is that you're not sending your username and password into the network and then Facebook tells you, yes, you've, you've given me the right data. You're actually signing a transaction local on your computer, public, private key cryptography. You, you sign a transaction locally with your private key, and then the network receives that signed transaction and verifies that it was your private key that signed it because it knows your public key, and, and there's a way to do that with the public private key magic. So uh, view functions, view methods don't require a signature, right? and I'll show you what that means. So here's just a couple of simple examples of these functions. and uh, this is what they look like in code. So uh, this one, you call it, it basically just logs something. This one, you call it and it returns true. This one, you call it and it returns a string. So this is a contract. This, we're looking at the code of a smart contract right now. Sorry if that wasn't clear. This one checks to see the, the sender, who the sender is. And by the way, context sender, like this is your cryptographically verifiable identity. In Rust, this looks like ENV uh, signer account uh, ID, and it's a, a method that you call. That's that's in, in Rust, what it looks like in a Rust contract. So instead of the word context, you're using ENV, which is the standard WASM um, uh, hook into the, the WASM execution environment in Rust. Uh, and then signer account ID is the, the method name. Okay, so that there'll, there'll be differences like that that you'll notice. Um, and then, um, and so here again, uh, we're writing to storage in this case. And now here we're wrapping storage with this abstraction called uh, persistent DQ, which we can command click and see it's basically 
uh, you know, this, this wrapper around storage. So we're using the storage API, but we have these, these convenience methods here, like, um, uh, you know, does it contain the index, uh, you know, aliases for operators like this. So, so that's what, that's what these, these collections are that I mentioned earlier. So this is a smart contract. Here's what it looks like. And then what this uh, system, what this, this uh, repository has you do is uh, for Windows users, you might run into some issues with some of these commands, by the way. It has you go in basically and build this and then deploy it using this near dev deploy where you point at the contract. So like, I think this path here, unless you're using a specific kind of terminal on Windows, this path will need to be something like C backslash, you know, my documents, like that kind of stuff on Windows, for example. So just be aware, you might run into some stuff here, but there will be other people that can help you with that in the Discord. If not, I'm happy to spin up a Windows virtual machine and, uh, and, uh, and, and try and replicate your error and help you with it. If you're using a Mac, all this will, or Linux, all this will just work out of the box. And so here's the, the contract init. And then a run that goes through and runs these methods. And here sometimes there's explanations of how these work with some links into the documentation for you. So you can take a look at this repository. So enough talk, let's actually see how this works. So uh, the, the way I've, I've done this, let me just, let me just start here. Uh, and I will um, come here and say clone. So code, I'm gonna grab this, git clone. I'm gonna grab this starter and this is like the, you know, starter for, for AS. I'll just call it that, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, you can call it whatever you want. I, I happen to ha already have the thing there. So I'm, I'm gonna just go into here. Okay, so that's my um, folder. These are the files that I've got. Can everybody see this? Okay, it's big enough, okay. And so now uh, just, you know, yarn, I'm gonna install my dependencies and then yarn test unit. Or if I want to, I could just say yarn run and it'll tell me, Yarn will tell me what I can run. And so here, test or test unit, if I wanna run that. And you'll see unit tests, because it's assembly script, these unit tests are running using aspect. It's an RSpec type library. RSpec uh, syntax, the, the ergonomics of RSpec, basically same syntax. And so you can see it, it all runs. Okay, that, that's fine. And then I can go into scripts and I can go to init if I want to, and run that. And so here it'll say, hey, you're missing contract and you're missing owner environment variables, right? And, and that's, that's fine. For the first time I run this, I'm not stressed. I'm gonna export those variables next. And so um, this will run, it's building, you know, this kind of throws an error here because it it's doesn't have everything it needs. It's gonna redeploy the contract using uh, a near dev deploy, which automatically creates a developer account with a timestamp. This is, you know, some, some timestamp generated thing. And so here I'm gonna export contract equals, um, export contract, equals this account. And I'll do the same over here, export contract equals this. And what is this window over here? This is actually near account utils, which are um, included. If you go into um, this readme here uh, in the scripts, so maybe I can show you this um, in, uh, in this interface, it'll look a little bit cleaner. This is how you set up your terminal under scripts you know, Windows A and B. And in terminal A, you're gonna have these things. You're gonna export the contract like this. You're gonna run these commands, right? In terminal B, you're gonna do this same sort of thing. And here's the repository for this account utils that I'm about to run. And here's some, some support for operating systems, okay? So this is the readme inside of the scripts folder. And in fact, every, every one of these folders should have something like a, a readme to kind of guide you in, in what's going on. Whenever there's something going on, you'll, you'll see a readme there, right? So for tests, for example, there's a readme here that shows you what the expected output is. Okay, so hopefully that, that helps you orient yourself. And so back over here, I've just exported this contract. I've just exported this contract. So now I'm gonna run um, this storage in a, using a watch command that's gonna repeat. And I'm just watching the contract storage right now. I'm actually, I'm continually hitting the blockchain to see what's the storage of this account whose you know, ID I just put in here. And now I'm going to uh, run 
the contract. So um, yeah, that, that's fine. So I'm calling, show you no, I don't know what, and then I run into this error that says can't sign transactions, no matching key found. So if you get errors like this, can't sign transactions on account, and there's like an extra space in there, it's because, and we can take a look at this, because this is expecting an owner variable to be set to sign this account. I need some valid account on testnet. And so how might you do that? You're going to go to wallet.testnet.near.org. And you can click, that's, that's this. And you can create an account. You're going to make an account. It's going to be something.testnet. And then you're going to get 200 near in the testnet. It's not, it's not real money. It's funny money. And so here, export owner, just my, my user account, I'll use you know, sharif.testnet. And then I'll run the script again. Now, keep your eye on the right-hand side. As we go to write, now it's checking who am I. It knows my name. Now it's going to save my name. You'll see my name appear on the right-hand side. There it is. Last sender was sharif.testnet. And then it writes a message. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't look very pretty. Yeah, this, this wrapping's a little bit off, sorry about that. Um, so, okay, so, so you can see I'm the last sender and there's some messages in there that were written and then written out. Let me, let me try running that again. You'll see what that looks like. And so this setup lets you watch the blockchain and watch as you're reading and writing to the contract to see how your state is changing. That's all, right? That's all that's going on here. And so I've just written this message and now I'm gonna read it by popping it out. Okay, and so if we look to see what is this run script doing, it's basically saying, hey, call a view on show you know, call that function then call this function, then call this function. That's what these first three outputs are. So false, true, hello. And each one of these is logging something, logging something, logging something. You can see the, the log here. I can highlight that for you. There's logs all over this page. Then the next one is calling, say my name. And I need to use a, a change method in this case because I'm accessing the environment. So here under say my name, how do I know that this is sharif.testnet is the one that's calling because in this contract here under say my name, I have to access the environment. From inside the contract, I have to reach out and grab some piece of information from the environment. And so in that case, you have to use this signed message. It can't just be like an anonymous method. So hopefully we're at a, a little bit over an hour. Hopefully this has been uncomfortably fast. And some of you are thinking, oh, I'm gonna watch the recording. Perfect, that's exactly where you need to be right now. And in the end, what you're gonna do is you're going to look at this list of activities to do on day one. And you're gonna follow these instructions. Core activities, all I showed you was this bonus activity right here. I'll remind you again, if you've been building on Ethereum for a couple of years, about an hour a day is enough. You'll see it immediately, what's going on and what the differences are, no problem. You'll focus most of your attention on like tooling and where's Truffle and things like that. So we, some of this tooling we don't actually have, right? And so it'll be pretty quick actually, you'll, you'll get it. If you're new to blockchain development, brace yourself for two hours a day of serious work, even with several years of web development experience not sort of fake work. And if you're a web developer with just a year uh, of experience or two years of experience, decide now that you're gonna put four to six hours a day of serious work, the kind of work that's gonna give you a headache. Maybe you're gonna feel a little bit sick when you're done. That, that's how intense this is gonna be. So just to, to kind of get, I don't want anybody to be surprised at the end of the week, okay? This is, it's, it's gonna be intense. And we're here for you. It's, it's literally our job to make sure that you get through this. All your questions on Discord, all that kind of stuff, no problem. All right, so if there aren't 
any other uh, questions uh, at this point? Um, I'll get to your questions based in the order in which they're voted on. So if you like questions, please vote on them. Looks like we've got a lot of these. Difference between AS and Rust contracts and so on. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, if, if it's not already in the FAQ, I promise to commit to addressing it before tomorrow's meeting at the same time, okay? That, that's a, a pretty easy commitment. Okay, so let's make some groups now and then we're gonna wrap up, All right? Almost done. Okay, so maybe we can stop the recording at this point, Sasha, because I, I don't think the groups is, uh, is so useful. Um, and um, 